My name is Anthony Bouchon, and I'm a developer relations engineer here at Google. Welcome to yet another episode of GKE Essentials. Today's episode is part two of our intro to building large-scale GK clusters. So let's dive right back in. In part one, we discussed why you might consider building larger Kubernetes clusters with hundreds, if not thousands of nodes. We also covered how to think about your usage of the Kubernetes API and its resources when doing so. If you haven't seen it, take a look at the link in the description below and come back to this video after. In part two, we'll dig into how to think about your usage of GKE and foundational Google Cloud resources when building a large-scale GKE cluster. Let's break down four categories where you can get started. The first is designing your cluster to be highly available. This uptime that we look for from our cluster can be viewed from a couple of perspectives. One, continued uptime for the infrastructure that runs our workloads. And two, continued uptime for the Kubernetes control plane, which you as an operator may interact with regularly. The next is working through networking to ensure its various pieces can scale with your cluster. This includes IP address management, DNS, and load balancing. Third, we want to make sure that we can enable our workloads, ensuring that they have the resources that they need, but also do not contend with one another. Finally, we want to ensure that quotas and limits are appropriately set to support large-scale GKE clusters. Together, applying practices across these four areas of considerations make a great starting point to building large-scale clusters in GKE. Let's now talk about those practices. When building for high availability in GKE, you'll have considerations both at the control plane and the node level for your workloads. Regional clusters in GKE are recommended for achieving high availability. With regional clusters, by default, there are three replicas of your control plane, each in a different zone of a region. This protects your control plane against any zonal outage. It also provides high availability during your upgrade lifecycle, as replicas of the control plane are upgraded one at a time, with the remaining two still available to serve requests. This means that operators and pipelines can continue to interact with the Kubernetes API, even during upgrades. Regional clusters also provide high availability at the node pool level, allowing for the allocatable resources like CPU and memory for your workloads to actually be distributed across zones. Paired with GKE support for regional persistent disks, this makes your workloads, stateless or stateful, resilient across multiple failure domains. Of course, there are corner cases where you may need a workload only in one specific zone. For workloads that are latency sensitive or need specialized resources like GPUs that are only available in a single zone. GKE supports creating a node pool in a subset of the region zones as well. Now let's talk about what we need to consider with care on everyone's favorite topic, networking. In GKE, there are specific practices you can use to handle potential issues around IP address management and DNS scalability. You should also be cognizant of what load balancers your tenants will require in order to prepare your cluster accordingly. At this scale, we'll have many workloads running in a single GKE cluster. And in a GKE cluster, every single one of those pods gets an IP address. This can actually make planning around IP address allocation tricky especially when considering that not wasting IPv4 address space is top of mind. GKE provides two features that can help you tackle this, Flexible Pod Cider and Discontiguous Multi-Pod Cider. Flexible Pod Cider allows for you to reduce the number of IP addresses each node has to give to pods, which allows for less waste. Discontiguous Multi-Pod Cider allows for you to grow the IP address space that you allocate to a cluster incrementally as you add new node pools. Each of these features can help you tackle IP address management in a large-scale GKE cluster. Cluster DNS also requires attention at large scale. By default, kubeDNS runs as a deployment in your GKE cluster with its own autoscaler. At scale, this can become a bottleneck as more workloads in the same cluster generate more request load to this kubeDNS service. In GKE, you can enable node local DNS cache, which deploys a daemon to each node to serve cache DNS responses to pods. This relieves pressure on kubeDNS as only cache misses hit the centralized service. 
GKE also supports a fully managed cluster DNS infrastructure with Cloud DNS for GKE. This removes DNS resolution from the cluster's infrastructure and utilizes a fully managed platform, Cloud DNS, instead. Finally, you'll want to plan for what workloads will need from a load balancing perspective to expose their workloads to clients. For Layer 7 load balancers, both internal and external configurations are best supported at scale when using VPC native clusters. This makes pod IPs natively routable in your VPC instead of utilizing routing tables and is the default configuration for all clusters in the 121 patch listed and newer. For Layer 4 external load balancers, these are only supported in clusters up to 1,000 nodes. This is often the default service type for in-cluster proxies like Nginx, so it's important to know what your tenant's workloads may need here. Finally, for Layer 4 internal load balancers, there is a 250 node limitation, which can be circumvented when enabling GKE subsetting in your cluster. This is a feature in GKE that automatically partitions the backends of your cluster into groups that allow you to scale the cluster beyond 250 nodes with Layer 4 internal load balancers. Now let's talk about how you can best support your tenant workloads. For starters, you'll want to ensure that the nodes you create can adequately support your workloads requirements. Once you've designed the node pools appropriately, you can then design a strategy around the workload's permissions and potential optimizations. Node pool design has sets of configurations that are relevant to how your workloads run on the nodes in the node pool. For one, if cluster auto-scaling is enabled at the cluster level, you still have the option to choose which node pools are eligible to auto-scale. This is especially important for workloads that utilize horizontal pod auto-scaling. Can the nodes that support the pod requests from these pods auto-scale as well? Machine types are also critical. In GKE, you have the opportunity to create multiple node pools, potentially from different machine families. Depending on your workloads, you may find better performance from compute or memory optimized instances, or even our new T2D instances when optimizing for price performance. It's important to consider traits of the machines underneath the surface level as well, with network bandwidth being a critical one. All pods on a given node share the same underlying network bandwidth. This network bandwidth is a function of the amount of CPU available to the machine. So it's important to think about how much networking bandwidth each node will get. And if you have networking intensive workloads, considering isolating those to their own nodes or node pools. This goes the same for disk performance. The more CPU on the machine, the better performance your workloads experience. And there is an additional consideration with disk as well as each Kubernetes persistent volume is a new disk mounted to the underlying node. Each node then has a maximum number of disks that it can have mounted at a single time. So when considering creating purpose-built node pools to isolate specific workloads, you can use functionality such as node selectors and node affinity to direct workloads to these node pools. In combination with taints and tolerations, you can effectively reserve node pools for specific workloads repelling any workloads not meant for that node pool's resources. Once the foundation of your workloads infrastructure has been settled, you can then move on to other best practices or optimizations, including granting granular GCP permissions to workloads with workload identity, reducing startup latency for pods using GKE image streaming, or implementing GKE usage metering to understand how efficiently teams run their workloads in your cluster. And finally, we wrap with GCP quotas. This is the consideration for how your GKE cluster interacts with various quotas or limits in GCP at scale. Two of the places to start would be adjusting the Compute Engine API and the Logging and Monitoring APIs. As your cluster gets larger, there are more read or list requests made to the Compute Engine API from the GKE cluster. Similarly, the more workloads you run in your node pools, the more logs and metrics are inserted into Google Cloud operations. That wraps up our two-part introduction to building large-scale clusters in GKE. Keep in mind that this introduction covered areas where you should focus your design. To learn more about these principles, check out the link to our published reference guide. Not only will you find more information on these specific topics, but also the process for getting the Google Teams help to create clusters larger than 5,000 nodes in GKE. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you on the next episode of GKE Essentials.